All right, we're back. And in this segment, we're going to start off talking about how we generate solutions. Uh, so the first solution strategy that we might use is what's called an algorithm. This is a step by step strategy that tends to be kind of time consuming, depending on the problem. Like the more elaborate the problem is, the longer it'll probably take you to apply the algorithmic steps. Um, some tasks require an algorithmic solution. Other tasks you can get away without having to follow all the steps. Math is a good example of an algorithmic um, process or computer programming is a great example of an algorithmic solution. In fact, they call in math some things algorithms and in computer programming, they call the, the code, sometimes they'll call it an algorithm. Um, so these are step-by-step -step strategies. They are not necessarily um, for us humans, our go-to strategy for solving problems. If we can use one of the other solution generating techniques, we'll usually try them first because of that time consuming component of the algorithmic method. Um, let me give you an example of a problem that requires an algorithm. Okay, so we've got three men, Fred, Ed, and Ted, who are married to Joan, Joan Sally, and Vicki, but not necessarily in that order. What we're going to figure out is who's married to who. So here are our clues. Joan, who is Ed's sister, lives in Detroit. Fred dislikes animals. Ed weighs more than the man who is married to Vicky. The man married to Sally breeds Siamese cats as a hobby. Fred commutes over 200 hours a year from his home in Ann Arbor to his job in Detroit. All right, so we've got to figure out from those clues who the men are married to. So here's how algorithmically you solve the problem. Now you might just jump in and you might try another solution and I'm and it may or may not work. Sometimes with a simple one like the one I've just given you, you might accidentally um, you know, stumble upon the correct solution. Algorithmically, you could, so you could solve a problem like this that has lots and lots of people involved using this algorithmic technique. So let's put Fred, Ed, and Ted along the columns and we'll put Joan, Sally, and Vicky along the rows and let's start marking off people who can't possibly be married to each other. So we know that Joan cannot be married to Ed because Joan is Ed's sister. That's the clue in the first, that's the first clue. Joan is Ed's sister. <laughs> so she can't be married to Ed, that's illegal. Um, we also know that Vicky can't be married to Ed because Ed, in the third clue, Ed weighs more than the man who is married to Vicky. So Ed can't be married to Vicky. All right, so that leaves Ed being married to Sally. So just through that little process of elimination, we were able to figure out very quickly who Ed's married to. All right, now what about, um, oh, and then by the way, you can cross off Sally being married to the other two men because she's already married to Ed. So, okay. Now, what about Joan and Fred? Joan and Fred can't be married to each other because um, Joan lives in Detroit, it says in the first clue, and Fred commutes over two hours a year from his home in Ann Arbor. So Joan can't be married to Fred, so that means she must be married to Ted. So now we can cross Ted off for being married to Vicky and we're left with Fred must be married to Vicky. So very quickly, you can go through the clues and figure out who must be married to who. We didn't even use all the clues in order to figure out that, you know, for example, um, Sally is married to a man who breeds Siamese cats and we know that Fred dislikes cats. So we know that um, Fred can't be the man who's married to Sally. Right. Like we we have some additional clues that we could have used and we didn't even need using the process of elimination using the algorithm. Right. So but a lot of times if you've ever been you've probably seen a problem like this before in your life and you may not have made the little chart and gone step by step and worked it out one by one because it's kind of time consuming. Um, let me give you another problem that can only be solved using an algorithm. All right. You are visiting a strange country in which there are just two kinds of people, truth tellers and liars. Truth tellers always tell the truth and liars always lie. There's nothing else to say about it. Truth tellers always tell the truth and liars always lie. You hail the first two people you meet and you say, are you truth tellers or liars? So you're the red person there and you have said, are you truth tellers or liars? The first person, the green person, mumbles something that you can't hear. The second person says, he says he is a truth teller. He is a truth teller, and so am I. Can you trust the directions that these two may give you? 
All right. A lot of times my students say, well, I would have to give them another question because there's not enough information here. But I will tell you right now, there is enough information here. If you solve this problem algorithmically, there is more than enough information to answer this question. So, hmm. You can pause me if you need to think about this a little bit more and look at the clues some more. I'm just going to go to the solution. The way that you answer this question is to ask yourself, what did the mumbler mumble? Because the second person tells us, he claims to tell us what the mumbler said. If he correctly reported what the mumbler said, then we can trust, the, we can trust at least him, right? So what we really have to figure out is what did the mumbler mumble? Because the second guy said, he says he's a truth teller. What did that guy mumble? If he's a truth teller, he has to tell the truth. And so that mumble must have been, I'm a truth teller. If he's a truth teller, he has to say, I'm a truth teller. If he's a liar, he must lie. So he has to say, I'm a truth teller because he can't say I'm a liar. The only two responses to, are you a truth teller or a liar are either I'm a truth teller or I'm a liar, right? But if he's a truth teller, he has to say, I'm a tr truth teller. If he's a liar, he has to say, I'm a truth teller. Well, the second guy says, he says he's a truth teller. That's true. So he, there's nothing else he could have said, but I'm a truth teller. So that second guy saying he's a truth teller means you can trust these people because he's, he correctly reported what the mumbler said. And then he follows up with, he's a truth teller. So he confirms he's a truth teller. He just truthfully told us what the mumbler said. Then he confirms he is a truth teller. And so am I. And he can't lie about that because truth tellers have to tell the truth and liars have to lie. There's nothing else for them to have said except for what we just worked out algorithmically. Because we don't tend to choose algorithms as our primary approach to solving problems like these, a lot of times this explanation of the process leaves us feeling a little like, what? What about this nuanced other thing that doesn't follow the rules? What about that? It's not our natural way to solve problems. It's why for a lot of us, math can be really challenging or computer programming can be really challenging because, you know, following just exactly the rules, um, you know, making sure that you always have all the commas in the, in the computer coding or the slashes or, um, you know, making sure that you're doing your order of operations correctly. You know, it's, it's time consuming and it's, uh, it consumes a lot of cognitive energy. Um, solving this problem, the liars and the truth tellers, it's, co it's, it's cognitively effortful. And so, for a lot of the problems that we are confronted with in our everyday lives, we can get away with not having such accurate answers. Um, so what we use much more often in our everyday lives is heuristics. I gave you the little image there, shortcut this way, because it's a rule of thumb strategy that's much quicker. It involves sort of a shortcut. You sort of jump into the problem a lot of times in the middle. It involves a lot of top-down processing, you know, based on your experiences, your expectations, things like that. Um, so they're a lot quicker, a lot less cognitive effort, but of course, more prone to error. You're much more likely to make an error with a heuristic solution than you would with an algorithmic solution. So let me give, give you some examples of some heuristics and some ways that they can lead us awry. I actually got to be on somebody's podcast talking about these heuristics. That was pretty exciting. I think it was over Christmas break last year, over winter break. Um, so the availability heuristic. One of the things that the availability heuristic can do is cause us to feel more confident than we probably should about um, the, you know, the occurrence of different kinds of events. I'm going to give you a little example here. Um, for each of these questions, write down, I always like to encourage you guys to play along with my little demonstrations here because it's just more fun. Write down a numerical range that you are 90% sure will contain the correct answer. So I'm gonna be asking you about people's ages and some other things. Um, and so you wanna give a range that you are 90% sure contains the answer. Um, if you really don't have any idea, you're like, I don't know, I've never even heard of that person or something, um, you're gonna give a really wide range. But you wanna avoid you know, zero to infinity kinds of answers, <laughs> like try and be at least somewhere in the ballpark. Um, if you're quite certain, you're probably going to be able to give a, nar a more narrow range. So you want to play along in that way where you can have a nice narrow range where you're like, I don't know, it's somewhere in this five years range because I, I know who the person is. I've got a vague guess. Um, if I honestly don't know, I'm going to give a wider range because I really don't know because the goal is to try and get um, 
you know, 90% of these questions right. You know, you want to have your ranges so that you're getting about 90% or more of them right. Obviously, if you, if you write down zero to, to infinity, you're going to get them all right. But that's not really the spirit of the game. So <laughs> um, don't do that. So here's the first question. What was Martin Luther King Jr.'s age at death? What is the length of the Nile River in miles? See, these are questions that you probably don't know the answers to. Don't look them up. It's no fun. Um, three, how many countries belong to OPEC? See, this might be one where you're like, what's OPEC? So just go with it. <laughs> go with it, man. How many books are in the Old Testament? Um, number five, what is the diameter of the moon in miles? The diameter, you know, cuts across, right? What's the diameter of the moon? Six, what is the weight of an empty, empty Boeing 747 in pounds? Seven, in what year was Mozart bo born? Eight, what is the gestation period of an Asian elephant in days? Nine, what is the air distance from London to Tokyo in miles? 10, what is the deepest known point in the ocean in feet? All right, you can pause me and struggle with this. Don't look them up, try your best. Come up with a range that you are confident, 90% confident the correct answer must fall within and then come on back. Okay, so hopefully you're back and hopefully you're playing. Here are the correct answers. So Martin Luther King was 39 when he died. The Nile River is 4,132 miles long. There are 12 countries in OPEC. It's an oil producing, I can't remember what the E stands for, countries. Um, there are 39 books in the Old Testament. Oh my gosh, I was off by half for sure. I thought it was like, I don't know, 14. Um, what is the diameter of the moon? It's 2,158.7678. So, you know, better have those digits. Um, what is the weight of the Boeing 747? 390,000 pounds. Mozart was born in 1756. An Asian elephant is pregnant for 645 days. Um, Tokyo is 5,959 air miles from London. And the deepest known point in the ocean is 35,994 feet. Okay, so here's what you want to look at. Are you, you know, were you 90... Were you correct on 90% of these? So that means you got at least 90 of them right. And 90. You got at least nine of them right. Probably not. I mean, I know for me, I would have been off on Martin Luther King. I would have given a narrow range because I was completely and totally confident that he was 48 when he died. And I would have given a, a range of five years. So, you know, either side and I would have been outside. It would have, I would have been wrong. Um, on the Nile, I, I was like, I don't know, 6,000. I don't know, right? Like I, I'm off on all of them. I would have gotten all of them wrong, even though I got to put a range. Um, I thought I knew some stuff. I was completely, I had no idea where to start on the Boeing 747. I honestly had no idea where to start with that. Um, the Asian elephant, I thought they were pregnant for about a year. I was off by, again, that's half, right? <laughs> like that's half as long as they're pregnant. Um, and then London to Tokyo, I, I thought it was 3,000 miles. I just completely, again, by half. Um, and then I thought the deepest point in the ocean was like 15,000. So yeah, I was off on everything. Um, even though we were given the opportunity to give ranges, I was trying to play along and not do the zero to infinity for every answer. And so I was really trying to play along and I really tried to make narrow, narrow ranges when I thought I knew the answer and wider ranges when I was kind of confused. And I still, you know, we tend to be more confident than we are correct right we um if it comes to our mind easily we think that it's probably really true and so then we think that it's probably right and then we're we're more confident than we should be um, what the availability heuristic tells us is that if you can think of examples easily it must be common so if it's easy to think of then it's much more likely to happen it's one of the problems with coronavirus is that it's really easy to think of so you hear a person cough or sniffle and you're like, oh, they probably got the COVID, oh no. Um, you know, when they probably have one of the myriad other things that make people cough or sneeze that more than likely is the cause of that, right? But if you can think of something easy, um, it's probably common. It's probably what's going on. It's what leaps to mind. So here's an interesting little graphic that I found that shows, you know, on the left-hand side, how many people die of the thing per year and then how much money we spend on trying to cure whatever that thing is. So the first are um, our illnesses. So you see the heart disease kills almost 600,000 Americans per year, um, but we spend only um, two billion-ish dollars on it. Only, I can't believe I just said only and billion. That's, what kind of world do we live in where I just said only and billion? But anyway, um, cancer, we're kind of spending 
at kind of the right rate for cancer, right? So we seem to take it pretty seriously, right? We spend more money on cancer than on heart disease, even though heart disease actually objectively kills more people than cancer does. Diabetes looks like it's about properly represented. Alzheimer's is a little up underrepresented with annual spending. Um, and then now we get to car accidents and we see that we spend more on trying to prevent car accidents um, or deaths from car accidents by changing, you know, like airbags and um, pavement and other kinds of things. And then you see that all deaths since 2000 in terrorism have been just over 3,000 Americans. And then you see this giant bill, um, you know, money that we've spent on trying to fight terrorism. Um, so one of the things that can happen with the availability heuristic is that um, if it comes to mind easily, we really think that it's likely, and then we end up fearing the wrong things, right? We put all of our energy into avoiding one outcome, and then it turns out that some other outcome is what's really going to get us, right? And so, um, you know, we spend money or we, um, you know, avoid certain activities thinking that that's going to help us. And it turns out that, you know, we're ignoring the other much more likely outcome. I found this little meme. What actually happens in the world is the big, the big circle. And then the teeny tiny circle within it is what's covered in the news. And, you know, what's covered in the news is what we become obsessed with. We debate it. We think whether we agree with it or we don't agree with it. We talk about it with our friends or our family. And it becomes all that anybody's really... Um, concerned with. And then we forget about all the other things that might be going on in the world that might be dangerous or that might be more fun or that might be, you know, whatever it is. So if it's easy to think of, we think it's more common. And then we, we put our energy into um, solving that problem rather than maybe other more pressing problems. How about the representativeness heuristic? I think we should pick this up in the next segment because this one's kind of going to take a little bit of explaining. So I'll see you in the next segment.